All right, um, like I mentioned in the intro video, this week we're gonna do things a little differently. Uh, I'm gonna go through the PowerPoint and then on the other videos, I'm gonna have some practical demonstrations of what I talk about here. So now we're gonna look at programming. Now this is a quick intro to just sort of terms and ideas. We'd have to spend a lot longer to kind of get you more familiar with how to program, but I wanna just give you some introduction to some of the terms and ideas. And honestly, what you've seen already with spreadsheets will help you a lot in becoming a programmer. Variables. Every computer program has variables in it. These are just like in algebra. Uh, you know, you'd have uh, what's the value of x, what's the value of y. The main difference here is we know what values they contain. Uh, one thing you can think of that'll make this easier is if you remember in a spreadsheet, we could do things like, you know, count everything from a1 colon to a12. Those A1 to A12, those are variables. If we can say, you know, this cell equals A1, that's the same thing as a variable. When we create a variable, that's called declaring the variable. And when we assign it an initial value, that's called initializing. And when we apply other values to it, that's called assigning. Variables are made up of different types. There are primitive types and there are reference types or aggregate types or whatever, but we'll get to those in a second. There are integers, which represent an integer. As it's things like 3, 4, 73, negative 124. Usually this is a bytes worth of numbers. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending on the system. There's a float, which is a floating point number. So like 3.14, negative 7.62, 0 0.5678. It's anything with a decimal point, basically, a floating point. There are Boolean values. This is usually a one or a zero, a true or a false. It's basically a single bit. There are characters which this is usually an 8-bit value that represents A, B, C, anything alphanumeric, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, anything like that, but it's treated differently than an integer. Uh, it, there are also other primitive types, usually dealing with numbers. So there's longs, which is a larger value than an integer. There's a short, which is a smaller number than a long. Anyway, there are a bunch of different uh, number types. Then there are reference types. The one that most people are familiar with is a string. This is basically a grouping of characters. So like we mentioned here, character is a single character. It's A, B, C, something like that. A string is a collection of characters, like a sentence or a phrase. There are lists and arrays uh, and a bunch of different um, reference types, also called data structures. We'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, oftentimes, data structures will have functions associated with them, but we'll get to that in a second as well. I want to talk about typing. There is strong and weak typing. Now, what does that mean? Strong typing means that once a variable is declared, it is always that type of variable. Java, C, C++, C Sharp, and other C-like languages are strongly typed. Basically what that means is if you've declared something as an integer, it is always an integer. It can't contain 3.14, it can't contain an A, it can't contain true or false. In weak typing, it doesn't matter. Once a variable is declared, it's basically a bucket. Anything you can put in that bucket will go. So that means that you can put numbers, you can put characters. These have pluses and minuses. Um, weak typing is a little bit more flexible. Strong typing, once something's an integer, you know it's always an integer and it's not gonna change to something else. So when you declare a variable, it looks different depending on the language you're using. On the left, we have Java. So you see you declare what type it is, that's int. You give it a name, that's width and then you assign it a value, that's five. Float, you say pi equals 3.14, boolean, you say true, string, you give it a string. And in JavaScript, it all looks the same. You just declare it a variable, you give it a name, and you assign it a value. Now, this isn't exactly correct because we would need semicolons and such, but we'll see that in a minute. So when, say you want to compare two variables. In Java, you would say width and then you use a double equal sign to compare width with seven, the value that width contains with seven, to compare the value that pass contains with true. In Java, if you're comparing strings though, you can't do this because 
this is an object, which we're probably not going to talk about because that's that's pretty advanced. And I think you guys would get it. I just don't think we have the time to talk about it. In JavaScript, there are two different ways to compare things. There's the double equal sign and then there's the triple equal sign. Basically what this means is this makes sure that the types are the same. This kind of gets around the weak typing issue. Like say you wanted to compare two numbers to integers, if it had a character 7, this would return false, that these were not equal. So the single equal sign is used to assign things. So this would assign the value of 4 to width. This would assign the value of 45 to height. Again, the equal sign is for assignment. The double equal sign is for comparison, is width equal to height. That's what the double equals is for. The triple equal is a JavaScript thing and it's exact comparison. Does width equal height and are they both the same type? Are they both integers? Logical control. This is an if. We're familiar with ifs from spreadsheets. These work exactly the same. You say if some condition, then do something otherwise or else do something else. You may remember this from spreadsheets as if condition action otherwise. This is exactly the same thing, but this kind of breaks it out a little bit differently and gives you a little bit more control. Here we can see how comparison works in JavaScript. We declare three variables, width and height, and give them initial values of five. Then we compare them. We say if width is the same as height, then square is true. Otherwise, square is false. And this is how an if works. This should be pretty familiar from the work you've done with spreadsheet. Functions. Again, just like in spreadsheets. In JavaScript, there's a function called alert. And what that does is it makes an alert box pop up that has whatever this text is and an OK button. We'll see that in one of the other videos. There are always a keyword like alert or pi and then two parentheses. You can declare your own, and some data structures have them built in. On the right is a good example of a function. You declare that it's a function, you give it a name, and then this is a value that will be passed to the function, just like if you're doing count and you give it a cell range. And then it, has, it contains in the function an if structure. So if this is true, display alert. Otherwise, display this alert. So then we would say, go to Disneyland, pass it true, and it will display an alert box that says, yay. So we'll take a quick moment to talk about syntax. Basically, that's how the language is structured. Now, this is different depending on the language. There are some similarities between all of them, but Python will look different from Java. Java will look different from JavaScript. JavaScript will look different from Ruby. Ruby will look different from Lisp. Lisp will look different from C++, etc., etc. Once you kind of know the basics of programming, 90% of learning a new programming language comes down to learning the new syntax. Most languages use curly braces or curly brackets to enclose sections of code. So like a function or a class, but we're not going to really talk about classes. Usually parentheses are used to enclose things that are being evaluated. So like this and this if here, the yes, no is being evaluated. Anyway, that's a little bit advanced. The semicolon is used to end a statement most of the time. Not all languages use that, but JavaScript, Java, C, C++, a bunch of them do. You can basically think of this as like a period on a sentence. When we declare a variable, like we see here, we end it with a semicolon. When we declare, when we have some kind of function, we end that with a semicolon. Usually we use double quotes to enclose a string and we use an angle bracket for arrays. An array is a data structure and specifically it's a list of values accessed with an index. That seems pretty confusing, but think of it like a row or column and a spreadsheet. Basically, these are values in the spreadsheet and this is the array index. So how, like in a spreadsheet, you would access something in the first cell by saying A1. This you're saying car zero will return sob. Cars three will not return scion because it goes zero, one, two, three. It will be Honda. So this would be false. Arrays are called different things in different languages, um, primarily because they act differently in different languages. Sometimes they're called lists, sometimes they're called dictionaries, and these all have different connotations. For example, a dictionary uses 
instead of an index, instead of 0, 1, 2, it uses a name. So it's just like a dictionary. You know, you'd open it up, you'd look at aardvark, and it would have the definition of an aardvark in a dictionary structure. You would say dictionary, and then in angle brackets, you'd have aardvark, and that would return the definition. These kind of structures usually work with a key value pair. So you'll have a key, which in this case is this index, and then the value is the type of car. This is a very common structure that exists in every modern programming language. Sometimes they're handled differently, sometimes they're handled the same. Usually these will have some kind of built-in function to do things like compare the values or get the number of items or add things or remove things from the list. What if you have a giant list, say, of every car sold in March in California? and you want to go through each item in that list, that would take forever, right? Well, that's why we have loops. Loops allow us to move through arrays and other pieces of data or perform actions repeatedly. Moving through an array is typically called iterating. To go through an array is to iterate through the array. Typically, to iterate through an array, we use a loop. Most common types of loops are for loops and while loops. There are also do while loops and a few other loop types of loop, but if you understand fors and whiles, then every other loop will be pretty self-explanatory. A for loop uses an explicit counter to control looping. Basically, that means for a certain number of steps, do these instructions. A while loop will continue until a specific criterion is met. Essentially, that means do these instructions until this condition happens. The distinction is a little subtle, but the next slide will make it a little bit more clear. So using the length function of an array, we can loop through it and access each member of the array. If you look on the right, we're declaring an array called cars, and then we're declaring a for loop. And it says for this variable i, which we're setting to zero, and while i is less than the length of car, which will be four because there are four items, and this increases the value of i. This basically is called an increment. So this is a structure from C, C++, and it's it carried on through now. Essentially what it means is for every step in the loop, add one to i. So then it will come in, it will alert, it will say car number i, so it's zero, is this value cars zero or sob then it'll come through and do it again then once this is finished it adds one to i so now it's become one and it'll say car number one is a volvo and then it will keep going through i know this seems a little confusing with words like this uh, one of the other videos will actually show this executing so that will be a little bit more clear now a while loop works pretty much the same way the main difference is we have to declare i first and then say, well, i is less than cars.length do all of this. Part of this loop contains an incrementation of i. So essentially, while loops allow us to do the same thing as a for loop, but for loops are great for known quantities. So if you know this is the size of your list, you know you can go through it this number of times. While loops are good when you're not sure. Say you're waiting for a temperature to happen, or say you're evaluating if something is a prime number, then you can have it loop through until that condition is met. This can be dangerous because you can end up with an infinite loop. Um, and you also have to be careful for nested loops. Basically what a nested loop means is if you have a for loop within a for loop, that's going to be exponentially longer than just a for loop on its own. Essentially that's because for every condition in the top for loop, the second for loop has to run. It takes a very long time, and this is one of the biggest issues with code. An infinite loop happens when whatever condition you have set to stop the loop is never met. These can cause problems. Most modern programming languages have some protection against these, but not entirely. So that's some of the essentials of programming. We're going to get into them more in depth in some of the other videos this week. But this is kind of just a quick and fast overview of some of the ideas and terminology in programming. There's a lot more information to be had at Khan Academy and Code Academy. I think this is a very valuable skill and it's it's fun. Um, Khan Academy's programming is really nice because they start right off the bat with you doing graphical things. Uh, Code Academy, less so. I actually like Khan Academy a lot better. Uh, Code Academy has more programming language options. Everything on Khan Academy is in JavaScript. Uh, Code Academy teaches you a few more real-world things, but Khan Academy teaches you 
more fundamentals and as maybe a better foundation. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please watch the other ones this week because I go much more in depth into the different things that we touched on in this one. Thanks!